Well, greetings, friends. We are beginning the second full week of September, and I am inviting you to join us on this study as we go into the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John. Uh, these chapters are known as the farewell uh, speech or farewell uh, advice to the disciples. And so we're going to lean in this week to John chapter 16. But first, we want to share a few things that we hope to accomplish in this study. Uh, first and foremost, the main idea is that uh, the invisible realities of our lives, our sure hope in Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit, these visible realities, should change the way we view and react to our circumstances. The head information we want you to receive and think about is to get to the place where you know uh, to know that we will face temporary trouble in life, but also that our distress will turn to joy when Christ returns, that head knowledge that if you're in the midst of the pain, I hope you had a chance to listen to the message on yesterday, or that is on Sunday the 11th, that if there's pain, it will turn to joy. It's God's promise and it's God's process. And the heart, what we want you to feel is to feel the pervading peace and joy of God as we put our hope in Jesus. And then the life change that we want to produce when the head and heart connect is to trust in the work of the Holy Spirit as he convicts and leads us, yeah, uh, in the way of the true vine. <laughs> amen and amen. Well, again, uh, some of you will be joining me on Wednesday and some will, uh, Wednesday at 11 and others uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m. And others, you may not be available at that time, so we're hoping that you use this as a self-study. But please, uh, go ahead and invite a friend, too, to travel with you during this study. You can complete it in about an hour or take as long as you want as you delve into the questions that could be transformative in allowing God to prune some things yeah, in your life so that you might produce that fruit and be bold enough to ask what you will, to see how God might bring things into your life in order that you might bear even more fruit. Amen. And so throughout this study, what I will do is ask a question and then I will say, uh, hit pause. And then from there, I'll come back and answer that question from my commentary as well. So let's dig in. This will be our icebreaker. <laughs> when has a bad situation in your life turned out to lead to a happy ending? Hit pause. Amen and amen. You know, there are many different um, examples that I could use where the situation started bad and then it turned out good. I shared one in uh, my message on the 4th of September where we were uh, really at our wit's end about housing for uh, one of our daughters in school and yet God worked it out in a major way that we knew that we knew that we knew that God had not only answered our prayers but God's fingerprint was on it so that we knew that he had not forgotten us. That's the thing. When it comes to life, when it comes to God's process, not our process, but God's process, um, we uh, get into this understanding that God has a plan that's better than us. And we know there's going to be pain and joy. And yet when there's pain, if it's God's plan, it will always end in joy my mind all right well i want to go ahead and read uh the entire 33 verses of john 
uh, in the 16th chapter as we lean into these powerful words of transformation. And I hope you will allow them to uh, speak to you throughout our time together uh, this week. John 16, 1 through 33 says, All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. <clears throat> they will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this so that when their time comes, yeah, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good hmm, that I am going away. You see, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Hmm. I have much more to say to you more than you can bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you, guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own behalf. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me no more. And then after a little while you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying in a little while you will see me no more? And then after a little while you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another about what I mean when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. Mm. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief. But I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. <laughs> In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Hmm. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the father on your behalf. No, the father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I have come from and came from God. I came from the father and entered the world now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. 
now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe, Jesus replied? Hmm, time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. My, my. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Before we get to that question, some situations are not what they seem. Hmm. An unwanted circumstance can lead to a better ending that you have than you could have imagined. And we start seeing in John 13 through 17 that there are unwanted things, but God has the last words. The, the disciples only knew that Jesus would be leaving them. They didn't understand where he was going or even why he was leaving. All they knew was the fear and anxiety of Jesus leaving from behind, leaving them behind. In this session, Francis Chan will guide us through all the benefits the disciples gained. Yeah, all the benefits they gained when Jesus left them. These benefits, including the blessing of the Holy Spirit, are also ours when we follow Jesus. Now, before we watch this video together, here are three important questions that I want you to consider as we are watching. First, why do we have a hard time believing in the invisible? Second, what difficult realities made the disciples fear justifiable? Hmm. And three, what blessings did the disciples receive when Jesus left? Amen and amen. Well, Let's go to the video. I've been praying for your faith, and I would encourage you to be praying for your own faith, because we live in one of the most difficult times, if not the most difficult, definitely the most distracting. I mean, it's hard enough to like look a human being that you can see, look them in the eyes and have like a conversation where you're not distracted. So the thought of coming before the invisible God right now and truly connecting with him, man, it just takes so much effort and so much faith. See, we are, we are terrible at the invisible. Living in the West, post-enlightenment, where everything is about intellect, it's so hard to believe in what you can't see in the invisible. That's why I pray. It's kind of like, remember in uh, Second Kings, I think it's six, where Elisha is praying for his servant. And he says, God, would you open up his mind? He doesn't, he doesn't see. Open his eyes so that he can see these angels, these, these chariots of fire. And suddenly God opens his eyes and, and the servant's like, whoa, we're OK. I can see into this invisible world. It doesn't matter if these armies are coming at me. Man, I'm praying for that type of faith to arise in you, where you can see beyond 
what's visible. Because the Bible tells us, hey, don't focus on the things you can see, but focus on the unseen. And so in this world where there's so much distraction, it's going to take a tremendous amount of effort for you to connect with a, an invisible God and ask him to give you even more faith. You see, Jesus tells the disciples in, in chapter 16, he says, it is going to get so difficult. He says, they'll put you out of the synagogues. He goes, an hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. They'll do these things because they've not known me. So he's telling them, look, when I leave, it's, it's going to get brutal. I mean, there are going to be people who are, who are going to attack you. They will kill you. And they're actually thinking they're doing a, a service to God. But then he makes this promise. In verse 7, he says a fascinating thing. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I'm not sure in my lifetime if I've met anyone who really knows this, this verse. I mean, there, there could be, I'm just saying, I don't know that I've ever met anyone who knows this. I don't know that I know it where I go, it's to my advantage that Jesus is not here and that the helper is. I mean, ask yourself right now, if you had the choice, if you could change the situation right now and you could see, okay, visibly, flesh and blood, the Son of Man next to you. Or you can continue on with the Holy Spirit invisibly being with you and in you. Like, which seems to be the advantage? I mean, do you really live like you're better off right now without Jesus because you have such an understanding of the Spirit and He's moving in you so powerfully that you know you're experiencing that, that John 16, 7 promise that it's actually to my advantage. See, these are the things we need to seek in faith. In verse 8, he says, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Jesus explained, this is why it's going to be to your advantage. It's when the helper comes, he's actually going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. There's something he will do, but he is in us. The idea is that the more the Holy Spirit fills me, then I can believe this promise that whoever I speak to about the truths of Scripture, the Spirit through me will convict them of sin and righteousness and judgment. This is why he says, you abide in me. If you are filled with me, you're going to bear fruit. Even those people who seemingly reject you, it says the Spirit will convict them of sin and righteousness and judgment. So my job then is to get as close to the Holy Spirit as possible, to know Him, to hear from Him, to believe in Him. He continues on in that passage. and In verse 13, he says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. 
All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. <laughs> Stare at those verses. Again, don't explain them away. Stare at them. I spent a lot of years looking at verses like this and then just moving on, just kind of skipping them because they were too extreme. They were too explicit. They, they, they seemed too difficult. And, I, and, and what if I don't hear from him? What if I seek him and I don't hear from him? And so it's safer just to, to gloss over a passage like this rather than saying, God, I must know this. I've got to know this. I've got to know what you're talking about when he says that, that, that I'm going to hear him speak and he'll declare the things that are to come. This is our inheritance. I mean, what if you had some rich billionaire uncle that looked at you and said, look, when I, when I leave this earth, that billion dollars goes to you. Then he passes away. What are you going to do? You're going to go after that. You're going to figure out where it is. And you're going, no, no, no. My uncle told me. And if you trust your uncle, you'd be like, I've got to figure out where this money is, how I get it. And here is Jesus, the son of God saying, when I leave, I'm going to send this helper. And here are some promises. And he's left this earth. And, and this is our inheritance. Somehow we are supposed to attain to these verses. And so are you seeking this? Are you doing whatever you can? You go, God, I have to know this. You understand why I say now, look, I've got to know this. Before my life ends, I want this more than anything else I can think of to know John 14 to 17. You see, because it's not like Jesus left and the work was done. His work on earth was done. You'll see that in chapter 17 but he continues a work as he's in the presence of God. The ministry goes on. That's why he says in verse 26, in that day, you will ask in my name. And I do not say that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and I've come into the world and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. So he's saying, when I leave, this doesn't just end. Now you can speak directly to the Father. See, at the end of chapter 15, he, he tells them that when the Helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. He says, when the Spirit comes, He's going to testify, He's going to bear witness, and so are you. There was some way in which I was going to work in conjunction with the Holy Spirit of God. That's what we're called to do, to bear witness to the Father. And I guess I'm, I, I can think of my life and and there were many times when I felt like ministry would get in the way or ministry was just something I had to do rather than now. The more I understand if chapters 14 to 17, the more I go, no, I want to do this. I would love, I'm, I'm tired of the trampoline. I'm tired of the, you know, just getting up. So I want to, I want to go for the moon. I, I, I want that experience where the Spirit of God fills me and maybe even speaks to me and somehow me along with the spirit of God I'm bearing witness of God that's what I'm on the earth to do is this your pursuit right now with whatever is left of your life are you excited to be one with God and to be fulfilling his work while you're still on this earth or are you just content doing your own work. 
satisfied with things you can see, man, I pray for eyes of faith and a desire to be involved with the things that are invisible. lean into our questions together. First, why do we have a hard time believing in the invisible? Go ahead and hit pause. Well, some of the reasons why we have a hard time believing include all the distractions. Yeah so many things that distract us that it's hard to focus on the things we can see yet alone the things we can't see and in a world where we're in this uh, post enlightenment period uh, where we understand so much uh, we tend to believe what we can see as opposed to what we can't see and what about uh, realities what difficult realities made the disciples fear justifiable hit pause yeah, jesus told him right um that you're going to be kicked out of the synagogue you're going to be kicked out of the church not only that people in the church or synagogue if you will will think they're doing the will of god if they kill you lord have mercy every pastor every chairperson every leader in the church should read this and realize um, that when uh, others think wrong of you um, that that is nothing compared to what the first disciples went through People in the synagogue, right, believe that they would be doing the will of God if they killed the disciples. <clears throat> Next, what blessings did the disciples receive when Jesus left? Hit pause. Well, Dr. Chen did a great job there. He, uh, they received the Holy Spirit and they received the promise that the Holy Spirit would be within them and the Holy Spirit would work through them and all of this would be to the will of God. That they would even ask in Jesus' name. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit working in them would testify not only would the holy spirit testify but somehow they would testify as well and in this testimony they would know that the world would be judged according to the word of god not according to us and so uh, in in this uh, place of allowing god to speak we don't do the judging we let the word of God speak in love and go to bear the fruit that speaking in love does. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Francis uh, opened the session uh, highlighting a problem as we struggle to believe in things that we cannot see. And in the West, of course, we tend to trust in the scientific method, things that we can see, seeing things that we can touch, things that we can feel. Yeah, these are the things that we believe in. Uh, in and invisible realities feel unsubstantial and more difficult to rely on. And so it is. We ask the question, why do you think it's hard for us? <laughs> uh, to trust the invisible. 
Mm. Hit pause. Well, we've talked about it a lot. Yeah. There's so many things that we see that we don't understand, yet alone that which we don't see. In this super fast paced world, it takes intentionality to slow down and see the invisible. Yeah, yeah, to hear, yeah, uh, the that which is not audible, yeah, to feel the intangible. It takes focus and it takes intentionality. I'm going to go ahead and read now before we go to the fifth question. I want to go back and read John 1 through 4 and 31 through 33. This is what Jesus says. All this that I, I all of this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. Hmm. And then verses 31 through 33. Do you now believe, Jesus replied, the time is coming and in fact has come when you're going to be scattered each to your own home you will leave me all alone yet I am not alone for my father is with me and I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace in this world you will have trouble <clears throat> but take heart I have overcome the world am I? So we ask the question, what did the disciples have to look forward to when Jesus left them? And why was Jesus telling his disciples about their hard futures? Mm, hit pause. Well, what did the disciples have to look forward to? They had to look forward to a lot of trouble, right? When Jesus left. But they had also have to look forward to the one who had overcome the trouble. Mm -hmm. And to have that same peace within them. That is past joy and pain. Mm -hmm. The peace that surpasses understanding. Yeah, they had to, the, uh, uh, the, the joy of looking past joy and pain unto the promise. Hmm, my mind. You know, Jesus shared a grim picture of the future. None of us want to hear that we will be kicked out of our place of worship be scattered and separated, be filled with anxiety, or become martyrs. No one wants to hear that. But Jesus shared this difficult future with his disciples so that they would be kept from stumbling and have peace. He warned them so that they would be kept from stumbling and they would have peace. In what ways could knowing that difficult times will come keep us from falling away from our faith? Hit pause. Never will forget when I was blessed to superintend, oh, about a hundred plus churches and things kept happening that made me anxious when Jesus said, Lo, I am with you. Expect the unexpected. There's something uh, about knowing that something's coming that will allow you to have peace when it presents itself. He says, I have told you these things. I have warned you so you will not fall away when they happen. Mm. 
my mind. Friends, if we expect difficulty, we will not be surprised when our lives take unexpected turns. Preparing ourselves today for our unknown future can actually help us endure those circumstances with more faith and resilience. What circumstances caused you to worry about the future? Hit pause. Well, you know, my mind really doesn't need a worry, a uh, reason to worry, but it can worry about the simplest of things. It can worry about the weather. It can worry about whether I will be able to um, audibly give the word of God in such a way that I'm out of the way and the spirit is able to move forth and do what the spirit can do. All these things about health, about finances, about um my children's safety, all of these things are easy to worry about when it comes to the future. And you know, that's the thing. When you talk about worry, there normally are three things we worry about. Either what has already happened, right? Uh, either what we want to happen in the present moment <laughs> or what happened hasn't happened yet. And I want to remind you that the one who has come, gone, and sits next to the Father has said, Lo, I am with you, and I give you my peace, and I have overcome anything that's coming your way. Lord have mercy. My, my. Ooh, I hope you're feeling this. <laughs> what could it look like to turn your worry about the future over to Jesus? Hit pause. Friend, I hope for you it looks like peace. I hope for you it looks like something you want to practice. I hope for you it's something that you develop to the point that others will want to have what you have. Yeah, yeah, this joy I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give you this joy. But the joy I give you, the world can't take away. This is the promise that Jesus gives. <laughs> At the end of the day, we can be at peace even during hardship because Christ has overcome sin and death on the cross. He's overcome it. And the Holy Spirit is still at work within us today. But what does the Holy Spirit actually do? My, my, my. Yeah, yeah. Let's take a look. At John 5 through 16, Jesus says, But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Lord have mercy. About sin, they will be wrong because people did not believe in me. Hmm. About righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Lord have mercy. I have much more to say to you. More than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. Hmm. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Yeah, yeah. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus went on to say, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. My, my, my. There you have it, friends. Hmm. 
Now let me ask the question. Praise be to God. What three benefits would the advocate give to the disciples? Mm -hmm. Hit pause. We see that the advocate will give them truth. The advocate will give them guidance. And the advocate will be with them speaking everything that they have heard from the Father. The advocate will even tell them and us what is to come. My, my. Mm -hmm. In what ways do you benefit from these blessings? Hit pause. In the hardest of times, I have benefited from a peace that surpasses understanding. In times where my mind is worrying, I have learned to speak back. <laughs> yes, I have come to understand that the psyche that is the mind that keeps on turning like a computer is an object. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's an object of this worldly experience, but it's not me. The me is the watcher the one that is with the Holy Spirit. And I am able to speak back through that spirit to say, peace be still. And able to use techniques to quiet this uh, 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 object in my mind. <laughs> yeah. When Jesus left, he was able to send the Holy Spirit who convicts the world of sin, leads us in all truth, and glorifies Jesus. Conviction sounds like a blessing most of us would rather avoid. My, my, my. Those are also those uh, three things, right? Uh, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. Number two, leads us in all truth. And number three, glorifies Jesus as well. But this question. But conviction is the Holy Spirit's warning light to tell us something is wrong and direct us to be more like Jesus. Uh, Actually, not a question. Forgive me there. Here's the question. Why do you think it is easier to avoid conviction than it is to face our sins and flaws? Hmm. Wow. Hit pause. Why is it easier to avoid conviction? Yeah, the Holy Spirit who convicts the world of sin, we can avoid. Why is it easier to avoid that than it is to face our sins and flaws? Well, it is the path of least resistance. Often there is a power in following along the safest route that the psyche will tell you to take, as opposed to looking at uh, the psyche to looking at our minds as an object, a tool often used by the enemy against us. It is each easier. It takes more energy. And so we must focus. We must be the watcher of our thoughts and see if they come in accordance with the will of God. 13. What could it look like to listen and respond to the Spirit's conviction when you feel it? Hit pause. Friends, not only did the Holy Spirit convict us of sin, but he also proves the world wrong. Hmm. 
when people revile you, we can be sure that God has not abandoned us. He is at work disproving the work of the world. My, my. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. What could it look like to listen and respond to the Spirit's conviction when you feel it? Well, it is that voice that speaks to us first. It is the pathway to enlightenment. It is the pathway to peace. It is the pathway to truth. It is the pathway to purpose. It is the pathway to God's pleasure. It is the pathway to God's glory. It is the pathway to live out your call. Mm. How do you typically react when people challenge your faith? Hit pause. You know, it depends. Uh, sometimes it is a reaction and I will become defensive if I am not manning the fort in my head. And at other times, if my spirit becomes offensive, I ask God the question, God, what is there in me that resonates with that that you wish to expel from my being? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What could you do to trust in the Holy Spirit when people oppose you because of your faith? Bye bye. Mm. Hit pause. Let me suggest that we can be reminded that this is what Jesus said would happen. And we can ask the Holy Spirit for us to not throw the baby away with the bathwater. For the Holy Spirit to reveal with us any truth in what is being said. And any falsities as well so that we can rightly divide the word of truth and get better when it's a word and not get down when it's fallacy. Mm. Finally, the advocate glorifies Jesus. Yeah, yeah. The spirit is like a spotlight in a dark concert hall shining solely on Jesus. He directs us to focus on him in every situation, where in your life is the Spirit encouraging you to focus more on Jesus? Hit pause. For me, friends, God is calling me to exercise greater faith and giving me the joy and passion for wanting to do so. I pray that you have completed this study and will send me some of your takeaways. So may it be. God, I pray that you will bless those that have heard, that they not only will hear, but they will have eyes to see how you are calling them, how you have appointed them, anointed them, and you've given them the command to love one another and in so doing, bear much fruit. May we lean into this partnership with the Holy Spirit in order that our lives might be transformed beyond joy and pain to that place of complete joy, a place where peace passes understanding. And God is not only in us, but God is working through us. In the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray and we say, Amen.